In 2 Corinthians 1.20, Paul says, For all, and listen, all the promises of God in him are yea, yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God by us, every praise unto our God. The other worship courses were praise to our God. Why are we here? Why do we attend? Why do we worship? Why do we sing? Why do we pray? Unto our God, we give Him glory in a world that uses His name to swear by. Who hate His name. Who don't care how much you worship, just not in the name of Jesus. Doesn't care how much you pray, just not in the name of Jesus. Don't care how much you preach, just don't preach in the name of Jesus. Why? Because there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's the only name that hell recognizes. Paul I know, Jesus I know, but who are you, my friend, the people of God who march under the banner of the holy name of Jesus Christ? Hell knows you. Welcome to the Voice of Triumph with Roger R. Woodard, Senior Pastor of Family Worship Center located in Kings Mountain, North Carolina. Pastor Woodard's ministry is reaching a hurting world with the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Now, from Kings Mountain, North Carolina, here is Pastor Roger R. Woodard. And to self-controlled patience, and I mean right now, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful, in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things is blind, cannot see you far off, has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. My Lord, that's where a lot of Christians are. They have been in the way so long that they're so judgmental, cynical, critical, gossiping, dividers of the body. They've forgotten how wretched they were how miserable they were until the grace of God reached out to them through the call of the Holy Ghost and redeemed them from something sorry into a saint. My friend, don't get your halo cramping your brain so much and just remember that on our best days, we're in the body of Christ because of grace, 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 grace. And if you don't have any grace for others, you better never need it for yourself. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And is that not what we strive for? To enter into the kingdom of Almighty God. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. And after all, what is preaching? But preaching to most telling people what they probably already know, and you try to package it in such a way as it comes alive Reminds me of an old farmer down in Louisiana when I was pastoring down there. And one of the agricultural teachers and professors of LSNU came out to see him, which, by the way, roll tide. But it's another message. And the professor comes out to the old Cajun farmer, and and the Cajun won't know what you do here. He said, well, I want to show you how to get more yield out of your crop and you can get a whole lot more from your farming than you're doing now. He said, Carl, man, get on back to Baton Rouge and you LSU. you. I ain't farming half as good as I know how right now. A lot of us, we ain't living what we know. Now we'll argue with somebody else about it. And what is preaching? 
are trying to stir us up by way of remembrance of what we probably already know. I, I, I do pastoral counseling. It's not one of my gifts. Nine times out of ten, the person coming for counseling already knows what they ought to do. They're either wanting me to agree with them about doing it or give them an out. I could dig there a while, but I, I shan't. He says this provides an entrance abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of God. Listen, isn't that what you signed on for? Am I boring you that much? Did you not sign on to at the end, with the realization at the end of this life, that might not have been what was in your mind the night you accepted Jesus when you knew you needed a Savior and if you didn't accept Jesus, there was no other Savior. And if you didn't accept Jesus, you were going to be lost eternity. But if you accepted Jesus, there would be a home in heaven waiting for you in the kingdom of God. Was that not part of the bargain when you said, yes, Lord, I want to follow you? And if you don't keep that in mind, you'll get bogged down in this cesspool of a world. We must continually remind ourselves this world is not our home. We don't want to get adjusted to it. Got a home that's so much better that I want to go to sooner or later. Oh, I don't want to get adjusted to this world. And it's so easy to do. But there's an entrance promised you into the everlasting kingdom of God. In verse 12, he says, I want to put you in memory of it because it's good. And I've got to jog your memory. And that's, that's Peter's admonishment, how we inherit the promises. But I want to go to 2 Corinthians 6 and read, in addition to what Peter writes, what the Apostle Paul writes. And it helps when you mark the right page. Beginning in verse 13. Now for a recompense in the name, I speak as unto you, my children, be enlarged. He's wanting them to grow, to become strong. And he says, this is, this is the way to it. He says, listen to the word now, please. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. If you are pursuing a romance, a relationship with an unbeliever, you have taken yourself outside the will and favor of God. If he, if she does not share your faith, and if you're thinking of marriage and you want it to be successful, they need to love God more than they love you. But if they don't share your values, if they're trying to lead you into conduct not, in, not consistent with your Christian testimony, hear your pastor. God did not send them into your life. Hell did. Any partnership that doesn't build up your faith is not of God. Any partnership that drags you down in your faith is hell inspired. Oh, but it can't be wrong if it feels so right. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing about marriage, take it from someone who's been married 52 years to the same woman. More testimony to her than me, but that's the truth. I have to speak the truth in the pulpit. Well, you know, you, you feel like the first few weeks you could eat one another up. In a month or two, you wish you had. <laughs> Stay within the Word. You see, most men marry a woman hoping she'll never change. Most women marry a man hoping she can change him. It's going to be hard enough 
for you to make it work if both of you really love the Lord. And so here we are trying to get God to bless what he's already told us in his word he can't bless. Don't nobody jump and run now now. I have been so sick of it over the years, especially with our young people. I've seen young men come into the church, well, they'll sing in the choir, they'll go to the altar, they'll shout and jump, they'll holler, do all sorts of things till they get the woman they want. Then you don't see that man back anymore. And ain't long, you won't see the girl either. Don't be deceived. And this is true of business. Don't start a business with someone who doesn't have your values. Ignore it to your peril. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion has light with darkness? What concord has Christ with Belial or Satan? Or what part has he that believes with an infidel? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. And God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, because of this, because you are the temple of God. And God has told you he will dwell with you and he will live with you. Because of that, come out from among them. Be separate says the Lord, touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness and fear of God. A whole bunch of preaching going on all over the land today whole lot of preaching going forth over the radios and the television. But you ain't going to hear a lot of preaching about this. I wish we were shouting. I wish we got this excited over holiness and sanctification. Read a tweet or a, a Facebook book quote. When a hundred people get more excited about a Halloween party than they do be in the house of God, something's wrong in the church. Yeah, just a thought. But people have always been more ready to play than pray. Oh, we are excited about just loving Jesus. Now, when he says separate, it doesn't mean that you ignore or shun lost people. We can't win them by shunning them. We just will not adapt their values. And let me tell you what's going to happen to you when you truly get born again. You won't have to separate yourself from your former friends. They'll separate from you because your holy living will convict them. And they're not going to want to be around you. They'll start calling your names, goody two-shoes, and all this other stuff. But I've told you before, the young people quoted me pretty well a couple of weeks ago. You know, if they call you a pickup truck, it don't make you a pickup. Whatever they call you don't make you that. You're the only one that can make you that. Let me just throw this in since nobody wants to shout with me. The person that's tearing at your virginity, you need to be able to tell them any day I want to, I can be like you, but you can never again be like me. This kind of preaching isn't popular, it's not taught, it's not preached much. Because we're in a go along to get along to be popular type of society. It takes a real man or a real woman in school or on your job to be a man or woman of righteousness. To not laugh at their smutty jokes 
or look at their ugly pictures, but be people of righteousness. You don't have to be like, like you're somebody, carry a big red Bible or a pen, says, smile, God loves you. You just live right. When you live right, He cannot be hidden in your life. Now, I grant you it makes you a target. I went through high school as the target. I think I had one teacher. I don't even think she knew my name. She's just a preacher. She's a study hall teacher, so thankfully that doesn't mess with her much. But I had that target on my back. It was a hard target to carry. But I had to make up my mind in my teens. Was I going to belong to God or was I going to play the game of the world? You will too. If you're serious about serving God, these are the things that you're going to have to consider. And here's what he says. This is not to condemn us. He says in verse 3, I speak not this to condemn you. And then he says, but it does give me, the seriousness of it gives me great boldness of speech. I can't tell you. The pressure that has come upon me because of my standing up for righteousness. Some have left the church. Others are thinking about it. Others attack me on Facebook in different places. I only I can't imagine what they tell their friends. Does it hurt? Always. Who doesn't want to be appreciated and liked? But I didn't sign on for that. I signed on to be a man of the word and a man of truth. And some of you have given me encouragement, and I appreciate that. But I just have to turn around like Jesus did his disciples. Not that you're my disciples. Will you also go away? I can't compromise the word for you. I'm not going to do that for you. Forgive me for being mean and ugly. You aren't important enough for me to go to hell over you. I haven't, I haven't laid eyes on that person that's worth going to hell over yet. Because I've got to face God. And that scares the willies out of me. It does. He said, I don't bother me. I don't know. God bless you. The thought standing in his presence with those penetrating eyes that look right through me that knows every evil thought you say well I live what would you have done if God hadn't kept you from it when we stand in his presence in every idle word and every thought and the intent of our heart is laid bare say ah, if I go to hell they'll kick me out for bootlegging ice water yes you can say anything you want to as long as you're healthy and functioning but you let that pain hit right under your chest and all of a sudden you know death is near you won't be so bold I think Joel you sang the song I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory. What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in awe of you, be still. I'll tell you what I think we'll do. Fall on our face, unwilling to lift up our eyes upon the holiness of God. The one who just let Moses see part of his back turned his flesh glowing and his hair white. And the very idea that we, carnal flesh, would stand in the presence of such pure love and holiness and not be radically changed. No, sir, you won't be so bold. And yes, I'm frightened of that. But it is an inevitability according to Romans 14.10 and 2 Corinthians 5.10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive a reward for the things done in our body. Paul goes on and says, 
and verse 8. Well, don't let me miss verse 6. God comforts those that are cast down. Thank God if you failed, if you've stumbled, He'll comfort you. He'll forgive you. He'll restore you. That's the good news. God doesn't want to turn you away. He isn't going to lightly give you up. He gave His Son to redeem you. And you think He's just going to lightly give you up? No, he'll watch over you. He'll tug at your heart. He's waiting for you to just make one step toward him. Draw nigh unto me. I will draw nigh unto you. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek for me with all of your heart. You have to make up your mind who you're going to serve and then come running back. Fling yourself upon his mercy. You won't be disappointed at what you find. God comforts those who are cast down. And then in verse 6, verse 8, he said, I can't repent for making you sorry. He wrote a bold letter. What was it? 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He said, that man in, in your congregation that's committing this fornication and won't repent, turn him out from among you and turn him over to Satan. Let Satan... Destroy his body in hopes that his soul, that the consequences might bring the man back to the fold. Apparently, it worked. And Paul is saying in this letter, I made you sorry, but I'm not sorry that I did. Why? Because godly sorrow works to repentance. Godly sorrow is not repentance. A lot of people are sorry. They're sorry they got caught. They're sorry they got found out. Or they're sorry because they're afraid they're going to be caught. That's not repentance. Repentance is such sorrow for things done or left undone that brings about a change of our behavior. There's too much of this crying and weeping going right back to the same mess. Come on, Margaret. I've got things in a mess here. Five Excuse me, four things I want to give you. When we set upon this journey, there are four things that I, in this message at least, I want to leave you with. One, we must remember the awful cost for our salvation. It's not a pretty little cross on a lapel or a necklace or a waistband. It's not a bumper sticker on our car or a statue of someone on our dash. It's an ugly blood-stained, flesh-stained rugged cross where when they thrust that cross into the hole prepared for it, it tore the flesh of our Lord. He began to bleed profusely because they had literally lacerated his back till his entrails were showing. The splinters of that cross dug into that open flesh. And he hung there till he was asphyxiated. Never forget the cost of our salvation. Is that cross too? Our constant companion on our journey is the Holy Ghost. He's always with us, leading and guiding, even when we push Him to the side, because He'll never leave us or forsake us. Third, we must remember our destination is the judgment seat of Christ, as I quoted, if you want to stand. That's where the bare truth about us will be known. I remember when I was just a kid, and I say a kid, probably early teens, attending a Church of God camp meeting in Birmingham, Alabama. Carl Richardson was preaching. Carl had served as pastor of the Lakeland Church of God in Florida for years. He said, one of the best young ladies in their church that everybody 
thought was just top shelf. Got in a car wreck one night. And she was dying, and she knew it. And in the ER, her, past, her pastor, Richardson, and parents rushed to her side. The doctor said, there's nothing we can do. She's dying. And so the parents went in to talk to their daughter before she left this life. Said, honey, we want to let you know how much we appreciate your life and how you've been such an inspiration and your testimony and walk with God. She said, stop. Mom and dad, it's a lie. I'll live one life in front of you and another life in private. And I'm telling it as he told it. You can question this all you wish. He said, she said, I, I'm going to go to hell because I have lived a hypocritical life. And I want y'all to know that I love you. Pastor Richardson came in, started the same thing. Oh, you've been such an inspiration, such a blessing in our church. She said, Pastor, stop. It's all a lie. Everything you saw was a front. And I want you to promise me that you'll tell my story because I know I'm going to die and go to hell. Carl said he, he promised her that he was. Now, I heard that story with these ears, not heresy, not on internet. I heard it. I was in the audience. You said, well, I, I don't believe that. Well, it doesn't matter what you believe. I'm just telling you what happened. It is possible to keep up that image to where no one knows the real you. But when facing eternity, Image, reputation, none of that matters. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? We're going to stand before God one day. God, not the pastor, not the church, not the community, not our peers. Stand before God who really knows us. And we better never forget that that's our destination. One final thing. Don't forget the eternal promises and the eternal reward that we've been given and promised in Christ. Thank you for joining us today for Voice of Triumph. We invite you to check out our website at www.familyworship.org. There you will find information on our church service time, special events, purchase our books and music, and also information on becoming a partner as we continue to take the life-changing message of Jesus Christ to a hurting world. If you'd like to write us concerning our program, our address is The Voice of Triumph, P.O. Box 396, Kings Mountain, 28086, USA. On behalf of Pastor Woodard and the entire Family Worship Center team, God bless you, and we'll see you next week.